Have you ever had a problem that you just can't seem to solve? One of those problems that has you running around in circles, trying to come up with solutions, but nothing seems to stick. When you're faced with these challenges, have you ever thought to ask yourself, how might nature solve this? A couple of years ago, I was facing into a problem of my own. Now, it was a self-inflicted problem of sorts because it was a design project I'd taken on. My initial inspiration came from here. This here is an image of my father, and he's the one on the right, by the way. As a man who spent most of his life chasing sheep around the mountains of Kerry, he's well accustomed to traversing across mountainsides. But as the years went on, I noticed a slight change. I noticed that my father's pace started to decline slightly. And while my father doesn't suffer from any condition, it's down to good old-fashioned aging. It's obviously completely normal. But what this did was it triggered an idea. It triggered a thought. Because I thought about how other people with even less mobility, perhaps through injury, physical, or mental challenges, and I felt that the barrier to access to the outdoors was all too high. So I wanted to create a device that would allow those with re reduced mobility walk across hillsides a little bit easier. And I took the project on. I was bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, and eager to make my mark on the world. I was confident that I could solve this problem. Me, the human being, we're the almighty engineers and architects of everything we see around us, with the almighty human brain. With computers and CAD and mechanics at our disposal, I thought anything was possible. How naive I was. So when I started the project, like traditional design methods, you do some research and you sketch out things and uh, you start to generate ideas. And then it gets to the stage where you build prototypes that actually go straight on to the user. And a lot of the prototypes looked something like this, where it was like a brace that goes on the user. There's a robotic element on one side, a battery pack on the other, and it was all very much unnatural. It moved the user's leg for them, and it didn't really make much sense. It was very much an over-engineered idea, and what happened with these over-engineered ideas was I got tunnel vision and then I started over-engineering the over-engineered, ultimately culminating in a pair of Wallace and Gromit style propulsion pants that not only would my father not be seen dead wearing, <laughs> they would probably set him on fire in the process. And here I was doing this project. More and more of these bad ideas filling the waste bin. And as that pile got higher and higher, I was growing more and more stressed. I could feel time sifting away, that palpable sensation of grains of sand silting through the hourglass. And one day at peak stress, I declared I'd had enough. I got up from my desk, I burst through the front door of the house, and I declared I was going for a walk. I don't know if there's anyone else here when stressed or anxious or trying to solve a problem, you go for a walk. I feel like it frees up my mind, helps me think. More so, it's a distraction. And as I wandered around the fields, I let my mind wander too. I stopped obsessing over bolts and pulleys and robotics. And I started to observe the natural world around me. I've always been in awe of this natural world, how it can create this one really efficient system year on year. And just as I was about to enter a sort of nature-induced, trance-like state, I noticed a hare dart across my sight. And when I say a hare, I don't mean the kind of hare you'll find in your head. I mean an Irish hare. They're a wild animal, and there's, for those of you who don't know, they're sort of like a long, muscular rabbit. And when I saw this hare hop away and spring off, I thought, that is brilliant. I was envious 
I thought to myself, why couldn't I have something like that for my project? And then it dawned on me, well, why couldn't I have something just like that for my project? The hair had solved the problem. It was perfect. It worked. I had my light bulb moment. I ran home. I didn't actually run home, but for the purpose of dramatizing this talk, let's say I ran home. Um, imagine a eureka moment, only I still have all my clothes on. Burst through the same door I made my way from not so long earlier, went back to the desk, and I started to do research. If you'll excuse the expression, I got myself into an internet-style rabbit hole. And while doing this research, I looked at animals, and I looked at nature. I stopped obsessing over an engineering mindset. And I came across one amazing creature called the wallaby. And the wallaby have this amazing little trick where they can store energy in their hind legs and use it to propel them forward. So what does this mean exactly? Imagine someone gets a rubber band and they stretch it, stretch it, stretch it, and they keep it stretched inside the animal. And the animal can hold it there until it needs it to spring itself forward. I thought, brilliant, perfect, and I did what anybody else would do in that situation. I stole it. I took it for my own project because I thought an engineering marvel as good as that is too good to keep secret. And now before my thesis gets retroactively removed from the university, it's not exactly plagiarism. What it is, is taking inspiration from the natural world because it works. This is called biomimicry. Biomimicry, as a term, was popularized in the 1990s, but as a concept, it's been around much, much longer than that. Da Vinci used it in his early flying machines, mimicking the wingspan and flight patterns of birds, up until some really recent innovations. Take the Japanese bullet train, for example. This amazing train, super quick, could get people long distances very fast, but the initial design had one big flaw. As the train was making its way through a tunnel, which is one density of air, when it exited the tunnel to the big outside world, another density of air, it created this really loud sonic boom. This is obviously detrimental for passengers on board, wildlife in the locality, and people living nearby. So the engineers had to solve this really loud boom, and they went back to the drawing board, and they tried to come up with solutions. And one of the chief engineers was a keen bird watcher. And one day, while out watching birds, as I assume they do, he noticed that something else moves from one density to another. The kingfisher bird, when swooping through the air, the beautiful, brightly colored bird, darts down into the water to catch its dinner. And it does so without barely making a ripple. The engineers thought, brilliant. They cut off the front beak of the bird. Not literally, they modeled it exactly. They got the front beak, and they just stuck it on the train. The end result? It worked. And it worked amazingly well. The train cut through the tunnels. No more sonic boom. It was an all-around faster, more efficient, better design. When I'd come across this idea of biomimicry, I felt like I had unlocked some sort of holy grail. I tried to apply it everywhere in my life, eating bananas upside down like monkeys do, hibernating all throughout winter because I thought bears were right. And here's where I learned the caveat. You can't sleep all throughout winter. You might get fired. And the caveat is sometimes you can copy nature exactly, but a lot of the time what you need to look for are patterns. And when I looked at my own project, Yes, I had a mechanism loosely based off an Australian macropod, but I had no way of putting it on the body. I had no way of putting it on the user. Our way of doing traditional manufacturing is we take a big block of material, we carve away from it a lot of waste, and we end up with a different shaped block of material. It doesn't really make sense. Because in nature, there is no waste. In nature, there is only fuel. In nature, things don't grow by subtraction, they grow by addition. And I wanted to grow my structure. So I took my block, and I could feed it to this piece of software. 
And what this did was it removed all of the unnecessary material while keeping the same level of structural integrity, the same strength, yet is much lighter and results in no waste. This software was developed by using inspiration from our, how our own bones grow, how mammalian bones grow. If you've ever seen them, they're full of funky shapes and there are holes and they look kind of odd, but there's a reason for it. It's because nature takes the resources available and uses them to the most efficient use possible. I know it's something that was organic. It flowed with the user rather than working against. It was as much art as it was engineering. So here I was at the end of the project. I had something that I felt might help people walk across hillsides if their mobility was, if they were struggling with mobility. But it wasn't so much the design. It wasn't so much the concept that struck me. What struck me was the inspiration. What struck me was the biomimicry. Biomimicry is an amazing, amazing concept. The natural world has been problem solving for a long, long time. Think of it like 3.8 billion years of R&D. Biomimicry is a truly wonderful concept and it is not just reserved for designers. You could be developing an algorithm and look to the working flow of honeybees or trying to find better ways to heat and cool your home and take inspiration from termite mountains. These might sound like crazy ideas, but these are real life examples with real and successful results. You could even be like my own father when hearing about these biologically infused ideas, started to collect and filter water in a similar way that trees do. Biomimicry works amazingly well on these smaller personal projects, but what's perhaps even greater are the greater challenges that we face. Take our climate crisis, for example. Yes, there are some days where it feels bleak, as if the challenge is almost too difficult to overcome. But there is hope. If we look if we listen to the natural world and see the processes that have been applied there, we will find solutions. I truly and sincerely believe that biomimicry holds the key to unlocking us out of this ecological disaster. Yes, we are pushing the natural world close to the brink of collapse and without immediate intervention it may be too late, but it is possible. We can do it, we human beings, that almighty brain that I spoke of. We often forget one thing. We forget that we are part of nature too. For too long we have felt this detachment from the natural world as if what's out there isn't part of us, but it is. It's time to reinstate us back into our natural world. And if we want to create the beautiful green and blue circular and sustainable globe we all dream of, it is possible. And it could all start with one question. How would nature solve this? Thank you.